when you get to that fork in the road where expert A tells you one thing, expert B tells you another thing, what do you do? And as the old saying goes, when you get to that fork in the road, take it. I never quite found that saying very helpful, so hopefully what I say today might be a touch more helpful. Let's look at the quiz you took today. You should drink at least eight glasses of water per day. Is that true or is that false? That's false. That's false. There's no evidence that you have to drink that much water to ensure adequate fluid intake. Adequate fluid intake varies from person to person, varies on your size, varies on your activity level, varies on your personal metabolism. So eight glasses of water, that's false. We only use 10% of our brains. Is that true or is that false? False. That's way false. So today we have this thing called functional magnetic resonance imaging. And you can use a labeled glucose molecule that cells can take up. The scanner can tell which cells are metabolically active when they take it up. Lots and lots and lots and lots of fMRI studies have failed to find that part of our brain that we don't use. You don't use all of your brain all the time, but you don't have one part of your brain that you never use unless you know you can do it with all or something like that. <laughs> Hair and fingernails continue to grow after death. That's false. In the Middle Ages, there are actually stories of coffins that would explode because of the hair of the growth of the corpse. Those stories were almost certainly not true. But the reason that hair and fingernails can appear to grow after you die is that the skin starts to dehydrate. So the scalp retracts and the skin around the fingernails retract. So they appear to grow, but they don't actually grow. A hair follicle at least be alive in order to make actual hair proteins to make more hair. Same thing with nail beds. That's false. Reading in dim light ruins your eyesight. Is that true or is that false? That's false. Ophthalmological research has looked at this pretty intently. No one has shown with any study that while dim light is not good for focusing, it doesn't damage your eyesight to read in dim light. That's false. Shaving causes your hair to grow back faster. Or causes your hair to grow back coarser. Is that true? Or is that false? That's false. That's false. Shaving does not affect the thickness or the rate of hair growth. Shaved hair doesn't have that fine taper of unshaved hair. That makes it seem coarser. Now, by the way, I have references for all these. I pulled the references off because when I put the references on the slide, that really pissed me. If you want references for these, I have all the references. I have them right here. Okay, nursing students, there are a lot of you here. Mobile phones are dangerous in hospitals. Is that true or is that false? It has to be true. Sounds That's true. false. That's false. There's a big paper from 2006. The European Medical Association took cell phones, studied them all around the hospitals, put them as close as half a foot next to monitors and medical equipment, whatever. There's no difference whatsoever. Uh, there was a Dutch study that said if you're within a meter of a heart monitor, the heart monitor might start to go a little wonky. Uh, but beyond that, that's the only study. That's, that's in contradiction to about six or seven other studies that show mobile phones, no matter where you use in the hospital, do not affect medical equipment. So that's false. Eating turkey makes people especially drowsy. Is that true? Or is that false? That's false. So turkey has this amino acid, tryptophan. Tryptophan is a precursor of the neurotransmitter serotonin. Problem is, turkey really doesn't have that much tryptophan. Chicken has a lot more tryptophan than turkey. Does chicken make you tired? And now, no, so it's not the turkey, it's the big decadent meal, probably, that makes you more tired. That's why in our family, we have a tradition after Thanksgiving supper, we go for a walk. And then everybody wakes up. Then we have pie. Let's try a few more. Face masks decrease, decrease blood oxygen levels. That's false. There was a big study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association looking at elderly people. They had elderly people walk on a treadmill at a decline with and without masks, and then they put pulse ox monitors on them. You know what difference they found? No significant difference. It matters what you make the face mask out of, because if you make it out of a, 
an unoxygen permeable thing. It'll you'll die. <laughs> well, these people don't wear N95s. They still didn't have a difference in their blood oxygen allowance. So that's false. Uh, plastic that bags. False. Kill you. <laughs> However, it is clear that people who wear masks think that they're getting less oxygen. So people will actually start to hyperventilate because they think their blood oxygen levels are lower, even though they aren't. That is a real thing, especially in children. The more muscle mass you have, the more calories you burn. Is that true or is that false? That's true. That's true. Muscles, when they're at rest, burn fat. So the more muscle mass you have, the more calories you burn at rest. All right, so what's the upshot of all this? The upshot of all this, we are awash in medical information. The second you pick up your phone and you go to your news feeds, there's probably going to be medical information in some of those news feeds. A lot of what you're getting is baloney. A good part of what you're getting is baloney. A good part of what you're getting on social media is complete baloney. A lot of what you read on Twitter is double baloney. <laughs> Twitter is an open sewer of misinformation, frankly. Um, so, should you be surprised at this? This is the part, I think, where we as Christians maybe get a little over-optimistic about the goodness of humanity. Listen to what the scripture says. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Fallen short. Fallen short physically, fallen short mentally. That means your minds too. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. No one does good not even one. Listen to what a healthcare worker or healthcare researcher says about science. Research requires trust and ability to ver verify work. That's the heart of science. Now listen to this. No one does good. No, not one. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. Their deeds. That includes their science, too. There's no one who does good. Two verses later, it says, all have turned away. All includes scientists too. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Not even one. That includes the person at the lab bash. So, we are sinners. And I could say this personally. I am a sinner. Depraved. Depraved in place you're wondering what it means. It means crooked. Very crooked. And rotten to the core. John Calvin says in his catechism that humanity is, quote, inherently impure, profane, and abominable to God. In his commentary on Psalm 8, Calvin describes human beings as poor worms. Oh, but that's Calvin. He's reformed. We're Wesleyan. We don't care what Calvin says, right? Wesley believed it too. Wesley says in his Sermon 44 on humanity and its nature, but was there not good mingled with evil? Was there not light intermixed with the darkness? No, none at all. Gee, kind of echoes Calvin, doesn't it? God saw that the whole imagination of the heart of man was only evil. It cannot be indeed be denied, but many of them, perhaps all, had good motions put into their hearts, for the Spirit of God did then also strive with man. If happily he might repent, but still, in his flesh dwelt no good thing. All his nature was purely evil. It was wholly consistent with itself and unmixed with anything of an opposite nature. So both Calvin and Wesley really are in agreement there. So is it any wonder? Look at the things we've messed up. We've messed up marriage and the family. We've messed up the rule of law. We've messed up friendships. We've messed up politics, warfare. We've messed up anything else you can think of. Why are we surprised that our science is messed up? Should we be surprised? No. As Christians, we should not be surprised. We really should. So, the uptake of this is that you can be wrong. Therefore, science must be approached with humility. Anyone who does not approach science and report science with humility does not deserve to be listened to. That's your first lesson of the day from this talk. So that's the bad news, but it's the good news. You see, just at the right time when we were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. But for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this, while we were yet sinners,
Christ died for us, and it goes on. God made a world. And in that world, he put humans with the type of mind that can understand the type of world that he, can, that he created. So you can be utterly, ridiculously, completely wrong. But you can also be satisfactorily, remarkably, and gloriously right. You can be wrong, and you can be right. Praise God. So again, that means science must be approached with humility. So how do we know the difference? And this is our crossroad, essentially, that we come to. What I want to do now is try and give you some do's and don'ts. To try and get you to think about how to sift through the medical information that you get. So here's rule number one. We have biases. We have interests. Ask yourself, what are the biases? Ask yourself, what are my biases? So biases not only apply to the listener, they apply to the one doing the research. Let me just give you an example. Okay, Dr. Baldwin's organic chemistry students will appreciate this one. Ketamine. How many athletes do we have here? Ooh, lots. Um, if any of you have been injured and you had to undergo a short procedure, you may have had an anesthetic called ketamine. So ketamine is uh, short-acting. Um, it's, it's a good muscle relaxer, good pain reliever. And um, the problem with it is it can cause euphoria. Researchers discovered when ketamine was given as an anesthetic, if they had depression, their depression went away, and it went away long after the ketamine had disappeared from their system. So people started thinking, can we use ketamine for treatment-resistant depression? That's what TRD stands for, treatment-resistant depression. There's some people with severe depression who resist all traditional antidepressant treatments. So an experiment was launched where people were given intramuscular or intravenous ketamine. And then their, their depression using different psychiatric depression scales was essentially measured. It was clear. Ketamine did tend to improve people's scores when it came to depression. So um, Johnson & Johnson, the pharmaceutical arm of Johnson & Johnson, Janssen, made the S stereoisomer of ketamine. Ketamine comes as a racemic mixture, a mixture of the R and the S stereoisomer, and they called it S ketamine. E S ketamine. Uh -huh. And they made it into a nose spray, and it's called Spravato. You spray it into your nostrils, and then it hopefully relieves your depression. So there were these clinical trials, and they were funded by the drug company. Now, the drug company has spent untold hundreds of millions of dollars on this drug. Do they have biases? Yes. Okay, everybody go like this. Amen. If you spent that much money on something, wouldn't you have biases to see that it works? Yeah. 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 They have to conduct these studies in order for their drug to be approved. So that's not a bad thing, but you have to take their studies with a certain amount of skepticism since they have these biases. Now, one of these trials, to their credit that they reported, actually showed that the drug didn't work. The other showed that it worked, and they showed that it worked pretty well. There's something called a drug effect. The drug effect is reported as a fraction. If your drug effect is 0 0.5 to, to 1, the, the closer it is to 1, that's a good response. So their drug effect was about 0 0.65. Pretty good. Pretty good. Later research, however, that was not industry-sponsored, discovered that the drug effect was 0.36. That's not so hot. Mm. Furthermore, the clinical trial said that the addictiveness of ketamine, ketamine can be very addictive. In fact, it's a major drug of addiction, particularly in drug. And if you abuse it, it causes inflammation of the bladder, and uh, that doesn't go away. That's permanent. So, the study said, because we're giving them such small amounts of ketamine, it's really not that addictive. Well, it turns out that in post-marketing research, it had a higher potential for abuse than the previous clinical trials. So what are we, and again, if you want the studies, I've got the references right here. So bias is real. It's real. So we have to ask ourselves, is bias present? 
That's why on any research, you have to report conflicts of interest. If you don't report conflicts of interest, that's actually you're breaking the law. And does the bias affect the interpretation or the results of the research? Remember, Janssen and Janssen reported a negative trial with Transform 3. They can report trials. It, it, it doesn't have to affect the quality of the research. Is it affecting the quality of the research in this case? So is it present? And if it's present, is it making a difference? And also identify your own biases as well. That's the first thing, bias. Rule number two. So the great philosopher of science, Karl Popper, said that in order for something to be scientific, it has to be falsifiable. While we might quibble with Popper's definition of science, I think we can agree that Popper was on to something. This idea that a scientific concept or theory is constantly at risk for future data just kind of intuitively, intuitively makes sense to us, doesn't it? Because science is growing. It's maturing, if you will. We're hopefully refining our results and getting a better view, essentially, of the way things really are. So science has to welcome criticism. It has to be presented in an arena of ideas. These ideas compete for each other. As human beings, we're very married to theories. Theories are creations of people. That's not a bad thing. But it means, essentially, that our theories have to constantly be in competition with other theories. Now, any sort of scientific inquiry that doesn't welcome criticism, and doesn't discuss its ideas, really doesn't deserve to be considered. That's going to come out a little bit later in some of the things we're going to consider. But if you have essentially someone putting forward some sort of idea, and they say this idea cannot be criticized, they're trying to turn themselves into a priesthood. There are no priests in science. Write that down. There are no priests of science. There is no scientific priesthood. Full bloody stop. A Nobel Prize winner has just as high a chance of being wrong as a freshman. Now, if the Nobel Prize winner is talking in their field, their chances of being wrong are low. But when it comes to making a mistake, they both have equal amounts of chance of being right. And if they don't admit it, they're not worth being listened to. I don't care how many letters they have after you don't have priests in science, you just have scientists. And guess what? They're human. So let's just give an example. This is close to home because it's recent. So the Great Barrington Declaration, uh, there were three very prominent medical scientists, uh, Jay Bhattacharya, who's at Stanford, he's an epidemiologist, uh, Sinetra Gupta, also an epidemiologist at Oxford, and then Martin Kohldorf, one of my favorite biostatisticians, he was at Harvard, he just left recently. They authored the Great Barrington Declaration. That's a website for it. It's short. You can go online and read it. These people are not fringe scientists. If you get into epidemiology, you'll find these names kicking out immediately. They're extremely highly regarded in their fields. The Great Barrington Declaration basically said the following. When you look at the data of who gets affected, seriously by COVID-19, it's stratified greatly according to age. So people who are older and people who have more pre-existing health conditions are at higher risk than people who are younger and healthier. So we should concentrate our protections on the people who are older and sicker. Kids should stay at school. We shouldn't close schools down. If you're going to lock down, the lockdown should apply to the older and the sicker, not to the younger and the healthier. They put that idea out for debate. Or debate. They were censored and they were misrepresented. So in the papers, you constantly read this phrase, let it rip. The Great Barrington Declaration was let it rip. Just put COVID-19, put SARS-CoV-2 on the population, let it rip. Read the, read the Barrington, Great Barrington Declaration, they never say that. They never, ever, ever say that. Yet that was the mantra, the let it rip crowd. If you read the WHO and then the UK government's uh, 
rebranding of this strategy, they use the term uh, let it rip. They say that they want the virus to go through the population unchecked. Again, read it. They never said that. That is a, that's a misrepresentation of what was said. In the Northampton Gazette, a letter by a musician named Shelley Berkowitz stated that Charles Koch, the billionaire, had funded the Great Barrington Declaration. That was a lie. Koch, in fact, funded the Mercatus Institute, which actually promulgated lockdowns. So Koch was actually funding people who were arguing against the strategy of the Great Barrington Declaration. Also, uh, Berkowitz argued that Sweden, Koldorf, by the way, is Swedish, uh, Sweden, who was following a policy like that, had higher death rates. That was also wrong. In fact, the other Nordic countries that followed strict lockdown policies had higher death rates than Sweden at the time. Then in the British Medical Journal, you saw what's called an ad hominem attack. An ad hominem attack. Ad hominem is Latin for to the man or to the person. You attack the person rather than their ideas. So let's say, for example, I'm discussing things with my good colleague, uh, Bruce Baldwin, here. And uh, Bruce makes a point, and I said, well, of course you think that. You're an organic chemist. You work with ethanol all the time because you're, you're a drunkard. <laughs> OK, now, I don't think Bruce has had a drop in the last five decades, four hours. Four decades? <laughs> no, it's been a while. OK, so that's Boha. But I'm attacking him. I'm not attacking his idea. That has its, whether or not he's had a drop of ethanol, A, is none of my bloody business. B, is beside the point. So in this article, uh, these two people essentially, they, they said that they were proponents of herd immunity. Calling an epidemiologist a proponent of herd immunity is like saying a physicist believes in gravity. We're all going to get herd immunity whether we get infected or get the vaccine. Proponent of herd immunity, what does that mean? Expressed opposition to mass vaccination. That's pretty funny, seeing that Bhattacharya and Kuldorf made most of their scientific careers around studying the epidemiology of vaccination. Yeah. Well-funded, sophisticated science denialist campaign based on ideological and corporate interests. There's, again, this, this dictum that they're being funded by big corporations. Again, that's a lot. Sophisticated science denialism. That's funny seeing that most of the Barrington, Great Barrington Declaration consists of science, uh, scientific arguments. Uh, and the list goes on and on and on. And again, if you want the reference to this article, I've got the reference too. Their Facebook site was closed down. Their Twitter accounts were all canceled. Uh, Koldorf was thrown off LinkedIn. Their Twitter accounts were suspended. And then Francis Collins, the NIH director, sent an email to Tony Fauci, head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, asking if uh, there was a quick and devastating takedown of these fringe epidemiologists. Collins then went on CBS News that night and called them fringe epidemiologists. If I had charge of fringe epidemiologists, I'd have to see what a mainstream one looks like. Tony Fauci then, in uh, order to deal with this, directed somebody at Wired who writes on food to answer the Great Barrington Declaration. Right, good job, Tony. So a Freedom of Information Act uh, showed this Francis Collins email. There needs to be a quick and devastating published takedown of these premises. I don't see anything like that. Is it underway? Three fringe epidemiologists, uh, Collins would repeat that in several public interviews. Is this how you do science? No. No, again, the ideas should have been put out there in their full glory, not misrepresented, or subjected to ad hominem attacks. They should have been debated. That's why they put the ideas forward, was to debate them. Because the big paper that was published in 19, 2006 excuse me, by Hendricks and colleagues showed that lockdowns don't work. That was the whole epidemiological dictum up to that time, that people were now arguing for lockdowns. That's what Kohldorf couldn't understand. This is not the way to do science. So if you have some sort of policy that's being put forward, and it's not being debated, and also it shuts down debate, is it worthy of your attention? 
Is it worthy of your belief? No. No. Criticism. It's at risk from data. It's in the arena of ideas, and because of the power of its ability to explain the data, that cream rises to the top. That's what deserves your attention. Three, don't trust politicians. Don't trust politicians, even if they have MD after their name. This is Marguerite Taylor Greene. Marguerite Taylor Greene is a politician. In 2018, she said that the California wildfires were not due to climate change, uh, but the vegetation was drier and more combustible because of Jewish space lasers that essentially ignited the uh, vegetation. Because of that, uh, she was thrown off her committees as well she should have been. And I wish the Republican Party would just get behind people who are competing uh, with her for a primary challenge. She does not deserve to be in, in, in Congress. Someone who says something like that does not have a full grip on reality. Full stop. Politicians have competing interests. So Anthony Fauci is in his job because the present administration wants to keep him there. If he's going to keep his job, he has to please the administration, doesn't he? He's got competing interests. Yes, he has MD after his name, but he's a politician. He's not a scientist. During the AIDS epidemic, I was always under the impression that Fauci read the primary literature. It turns out he doesn't. He has a sheet in front of him that was given to him by a staff full of talking points. He doesn't read the primary literature. Politicians also usually act, lack expertise. Now, there are exceptions. There have been people in Congress who are physicians who then after Congress, their stint in Congress went back to practicing and kept up their licenses and kept up their uh, continuing medical education while they were in Congress. There are the exceptions. But most politicians essentially um, just don't have the expertise. And also, again, their interests are divided. So if you hear politician so-and-so, senator so-and-so said what and what, your response should be, so, so. And I say this. Rule number four, don't trust journalists either, with a few exceptions. Journalists today, unfortunately, they get lots of things wrong. And does anything happen to them if they get the story wrong? Now, when I was a kid, if a journalist got a story wrong, you're out of a job. Today, you get an award if you get a story wrong, it seems. So they have little incentive to correct themselves. Now, while I am beating up on journalists, let me tell you there are some science reporters who are very good and who work very hard to get things right. And here are just some examples. Ron Bailey at Reason Magazine. I commend him to you because he has written books and then because of the data, he has gone back and changed his mind and has repudiated things that he wrote in those books. And he has pulled his books. That shows a commitment to the truth. Ron Bailey is a libertarian. He's an atheist. He says a lot of things that I don't agree with. But he has a commitment to the truth. So do some of these other people as well. Uh, Christopher Mims did not cover himself in glory when it came to the embryonic stem cell situation. But a lot of his other reporting in the Wall Street Journal is quite good. Same thing with some of these other reporters as well. These are just kind of my top six. There are a few others as well who are quite good. So find a science reporter you trust. Find a science reporter you trust and follow them and listen to them. If you read it in the New York Times and it's not by someone you trust, bin it. Throw it in the bin. Not worth your time. So here's an example. Here's a uh, reporter. Here's can is so-and-so one I actually like. Every time a hospital admits, discharges, or loses a patient COVID-19, they get paid. How many of you have read that on the web? Hospitals make lots of money from COVID-19 patients. So the American Hospital Association, quote, hospitals do not receive extra funds when patients die from COVID-19. They're not over-reporting COVID-19 cases. They're not making money on treated COVID-19. Truth is, hospitals and health systems are in their worst financial de shape in decades due to the coronavirus. In some cases, the situation is dire. Total losses, according to our estimates for hospitals, 
in the nation is 323 billion in 2020. There is no windfall here. Furthermore, hospital health systems adhere to strict coding and reporting guidelines. The use of the COVID-19 code for Medicare claims is reserved for confirmed cases. Inappropriately coding can result in criminal penalties and prosecution and loss of license. Loss of license. And exclusion from the Medicare program altogether. So I went online and I counted the different types of journalistic investigations into this chestnut. I counted 50. After that, I stopped counting. These people were not just quoting each other, too. They were doing their own research. So, CBS News and Fox News, are they ideologically the same? <laughs> no. no, yet they came to the same conclusion. Reuters News, the Denver Post, Denver Post, very liberal paper, the Post and Courier from uh, South Carolina, rather conservative paper, whether conservative or liberal, their investigative reporting all said the same. This is bunk. This is bunk. Yet, some people feel free, essentially, to just shoot their mouth off on Twitter as though this is true. Rule number five, listen to the people who do the work. Listen to the people who do the work. If you've got back pain, don't come to me. Go to Mitch. Mitch knows about back pain. Mitch knows back pain. Okay? If you want nutrition advice, I can help. The person you can really talk to is Dr. Ulrich back there. Beth knows nutrition. Okay, listen to people who do the work. And, and Beth won't tell you, this is what the high priestess of nutrition tells you. Beth will probably say, well, the data so far says this. But you know what? In 10 years, it might change. But as far as I know, it's that she'll have a degree of humility because she knows she's not the end all of that because she's not some high priestess of nutrition. Same thing with Mitch. She's not some high priest of back pain. Here's your word for the day, ultra-crepidarianism. Ultra-crepidarianism. Everybody say it with me. Ultra-crepidarianism. It means speaking with authority into a field about which you know virtually nothing. Speaking with authority in a field about which you know virtually nothing. You get this a lot where you have scientists who speak with authority outside their field and they get things horribly wrong. So you have astronomers talking about virology, and they get things wrong. You have weather people talking about public health, and they get things very, very wrong. You have geneticists talking about shoulder pain and how to deal with shoulder pain, and they get things horribly wrong. So if someone is essentially pontificating outside their field, treat their, pr their pronouncements with a good deal of skepticism. Now, Dr. Sometimes, Brannis, yes. do, you know, do you know where the word comes from? Um, it's, a, it's a Latin root, and it means Latin don't root. go beyond the sandals. Don't go beyond the sandals. There's a there was a there was a guy who had trouble with his feet, and another a, a cobbler came and said, "Your problem is your sandals." And he changed the sandals, and it worked. And so he went back to the guy and said, "What about my stomach?" And the guy gave him advice for his stomach, and it worked terribly. It made him sicker. <laughs> And so the, the moral of the story is don't go beyond the sandals. If you're an expert in shoes, right. talk about shoes, but don't nothing try. else. Don't do gastroenterological advice to a provider. Yeah. Don't go beyond the sandals is what that means. And that illustrates the point incredibly well. Um, occasionally you get scientists who will interview other scientists outside their field. And those can be very revealing. So for example, Jordan Peterson, who's a psych psychologist, will interview people who are experts in surgery, or interview people who are experts in other, other fields of science. And those types of discussions can be very revealing. But he's interviewing them because he will admit his own limitations. Six, be skeptical. Be skeptical. Don't, don't be gullible. Have a measured but stubborn skepticism. So. Get used to saying, and you know that how? How do you know that? Oh, I read it on Twitter. Red flag. Red flag. 
Red flag. Oh, you found that dollar bill in the sewer. Oh, okay. I'll get used to just saying, yeah, okay, I'm not too sure about that. I'm going to kind of hold my belief in advance. Uh, I'm going to suspend belief for now until I know more. And you know what, what words, three words, are going to be your just saving grace? I don't know. I don't know. Haven't read enough on it yet. Read some stuff, heard some stuff, but I don't believe it yet, don't trust it yet. Haven't confirmed it. I just don't know. Now, that might mean you're not a very good conversationalist in some cases, but it means you're honest. I don't know. Also, if you hear something that's too good to be true, it probably is. Just that. Not true. Also, if you hear something excruciatingly weird, like Jewish space lasers causing fires in California, it's also probably not true. So have some borders for what you're going to believe. So if someone tells you that ivermectin can cure COVID-19, say, you know, I'd really like to see a nice, controlled, double-blinded, placebo-based study that shows that. Not ones in Egypt that were faked. Uh, that never happened. It's just too good to be true, or it's really weird. That doesn't mean weird things can't be true. It just means you need evidence. You have adequate evidence that weird things are going to be true. So, let's do a case study and try to apply some of these principles. All right, so on the 26th of September, CDC Director Rochelle Walensky went on Face the Nation and she announced the results of the Arizona school masking study. And she said schools that had mask mandates were three and a half times less likely to have COVID-19 outbreaks. And this study examined school kids from Arizona between the dates of July 15th to August 31st in 2021. Therefore, we should all be masking our kids in school because kids who are, not ma who are masked in school won't get COVID-19, they won't take it home to grandma and grandpa, and we will defeat this pandemic. So this looked at two counties in Arizona. Pima County, which is way down here near the Mexico border, and Maricopa County up here. So one is essentially Tucson, Tucson and the other is Phoenix, essentially. You can think of those two. All right, so now comes the Atlantic reporter, David Zweig. David Zweig is a science reporter at the Atlantic. He's one guy you should follow. He would be number seven in my top six that I gave you. So he said, okay, let's just take a look at these schools and take a look at when the schools were in session during that period. He discovered that most of the schools weren't in session during that time. They were only in session for a small part. So that was red flag number one. You've got this time period when you're studying the schools and most of the schools aren't even open during that time. That's a red flag. Then he asked the question, okay, which schools were included in the results? And according to the researchers, there were 999 schools that were included in the study. And so he went to the Arizona Department of Education and he asked for the list of schools that were supplied to the researchers. And he counted them. And guess how many schools were in that list? 782, not 999. Okay, can you guys count? That's red flag number two. Red flag number three. Most of the schools were in Maricopa County. Hmm. Then it turns out 40 of those schools were virtual learning centers where students never met. 20 of them were preschools. The other 90 were vocational programs that were linked to already existing schools, yet they were double counted. So he contacted the uh, researchers uh, from the CDC once again. And they said, no, 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 it was 999, we stand by our number. He tried to get 999. He took the data, he stepped on it three, four, five, six times, he couldn't get 999. Then he started to ask, when did their school start? 
he discovered something shocking. The schools in Maricopa County, where there was not a mass mandate, started schools earlier than the schools in Pima County. Essentially, the schools, the school kids from Maricopa Copa County had three times the number of school days as did the kids in Pima County. So they're three times more likely to get infected. Also, the study did not account for vaccine status of students. Here's the bit that I want you to listen. He then asked the researchers, the authors, for their data set so he could compare it with his data set they refused to give it to him. Okay. Yeah. And what we've learned essentially, what does that tell you? The arena of ideas. Put it in the arena of ideas. Let's have a boxing match. Let's see who outpunches the other. No, I'm going to hoard my data. You can't see it because we're the high priest. It goes in the tabernacle behind me. And I become the uh, arbiter of who gets access to that tabernacle. Boulder Dash. Boulder Dash. You're supported with public money. You release that data. I think you should go to court and have that, that data released. Next one. This study contradicts the big study in Bangladesh that looked at 100, over 100,000 students that said that masking in schools doesn't work, and the big Georgia study that looked at 900,000 students and said that masking doesn't work. Basically, the study shows that kids, the mask has to fit properly. You have to wear it right. Does it fit properly when kids wear it? No. Do they use it properly? No. Do they wash it before the end of the week? No, you can say over at Warner School what those masks are growing. But in fact, my wife at one point, my wife works at Warner in the preschool. She would collect the kids' masks and take them home and throw them in the washer. And then bring them back, oh, look, your masks are nice and clean. Oh, look what the mask fairy did. And um, now the kids had clean masks. So essentially, we have data that won't be shared. It contradicts earlier data. And when you try to recapitulate their data, you can't do it. Does this study deserve your attention? Yet this was a study that was used to justify masking kids who were preschoolers. All right, so here's my summary. Someone says, follow the science. What they mean is agree with me or you're an idiot. They say, follow the science. Turn them off. They're not approaching it with humility. They're trying to be a priest, and there are no priests in science. Follow the science is bunk. Take that phrase, put it on the ground, and drive over it five or six times with your car. If it still exists, then pour gasoline on it and light it on fire. It does not belong in scientific discussion. Now, if someone says, well, you know, according to the data I have so far, data in hand, we think we may miss. And I don't see him back there anymore, but my dear colleague, my dear friend, John Councilman, um, he is one of the leading experts on uh, this reaction where you put Mentos in and the soda essentially explodes, this thing you've seen on YouTube so many times. Yeah. I have talked to Tom probably 12, 13 times about that reaction, and Tom, he knows so much about this, he's published papers on it. Yeah. Yet he'll still say, well, I think what's going on is this. He still has a large degree of humility about that. Yeah. If someone says follow the science, they have no humility, they don't deserve your attention. Trust is earned. It's earned in marriage, it's earned in science. If they haven't earned your trust, they don't deserve your trust. Three, that uh, Arizona study, I tried digging into the data, it took me lots and lots of time. It took lots and lots of patience, and most people don't have the attention span, the interest, or the patience for that. Doing that kind of work is hard work. Reading scientific studies that are written usually by people who couldn't, don't have an ounce of poetry in their souls if they tried, <laughs> is very hard to do. But it's hard work. Some people are better at it than others. Listen to the ones who are good at it. Also, for science to be possible, you must have the moral value of honesty. Yeah. Do you get that from a naturalistic worldview? No. You get it from a Christian worldview. 
Some people are more honest than others. Listen to the ones who are the most honest. Listen to the ones who are willing to change their minds and repudiate earlier books that they wrote because the data has changed their mind. Look, we all have agendas. We all have biases. Are you willing to change your mind in response to new data? Just ask yourself that question. <coughs> if you're not, okay, then let's consider your commitment to the truth. You see data in hand, as far as you know, the data was, 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 now if it contradicts other data, you're holding the two kind of in your head saying, eh, I've never made this out. But if you have hard data, essentially, will you change your mind? If you're not, then let's just respect and just follow the science below me. Okay? Because that phrase really means nothing useful. That is what I have to share with you, with you today. We have some time. I will now entertain any questions you might have. Uh, again, these are my opinions, and you're free to disagree with me. Uh, I've been doing science and science education for a long time. I think I've been the right at least to have an opinion on it. So, um, if you have any questions, I will entertain them now. Those of you online, um, just go ahead and use the chat function. In fact, I'll open the chat right now. So I can see your questions, just go ahead and type them. Uh, and, yeah, go, because if you use your microphone, uh, I won't hear you. Just use a chat. All right, any, any questions? Oh, it's all perfectly clear. Chat, go ahead. Can you think of a time when uh, new data has caused you to change your mind about something? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Could you give us an example? Of the age of the earth. When I was your guys' age, I thought the earth was young. And the data caused me to change my mind and think that the earth is old. So the age of the earth would be one. Uh, the other, I was very opposed in graduate school to gradient models. I thought gradient models are lazy thinking. And then as more data started to come in from other living systems, I started to say, okay, gradient models have something to commend them. And now, while I think people default to gradient models too quickly, I'm more than willing to admit, yes, gradients do occur in living systems, and they do play a role. And there are such a thing as more agents. So yes, I, I've changed my mind Thank you. as much as I can. That probably means nothing. More means means nothing to most people. Probably, but, um, yes, I have changed my mind several times. You're all so quiet. It must be early in the morning. Yes, please. So you, you <coughs> talk about the uh, esketamine um, in J&J &J, uh -huh. um, and the bias that's present. So what about with COVID vaccines? Right? What about with boosters? Mm -hmm. So the Pfizer data, there was a um, report that uh, the phase three paper, so there was a big phase three paper that was published in New England Journal of Medicine. And then the report came out saying that one of the arms, uh, the counting of the people in that arm was inaccurate. If you take out that arm and then you redo it and put it in, you still get a vaccine that protects extremely well. And then post-marketing research on those vaccines by uninterested parties. The, the, the British government, for example, has done a remarkably good job of following the vaccines and their efficacy. And then also the European Medicines Agency, uh, particularly Denmark. Denmark gets, gets big kudos for the way they've collated data. Their sequencing of uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, strains is the best in the world. Uh, they get full marks. If you look at these other outfits that have taken a look at the vaccines and uh, tested their efficacy versus their safety, there's really no question. The vaccines are effective. In terms of transmission, it was thought that they would be effective against transmission because people who um, recovered from the original SARS disease, which is caised by SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2 is most closely related to SARS-CoV-1, they essentially are completely immune to the virus. They will not get infected by it, they won't pass it, so it was thought that resistance to SARS-CoV-2 would be essentially the same, which was not an unreasonable suspicion to have. But it turns out that the vaccines don't provide good mucosal resistance, whereas infection from uh, previous 
resistance from previous infection does tend to give you better mucosal immunity. And that's where the virus reservoirs, and that's where you put the, a chew, you know, whatever. And that's essentially where you pass the virus. That's why the vaccines don't do as good a job with transmission. When it comes to severe infection and hospitalization and death, they do a very good job in all age groups. Um, so there is bias in their data. And if you look at the post-marketing research that's been done by other bodies, you get protection. Is it as good as was reported in the original New England Journal of Medicine papers? No. It's not as good, but still pretty darn good. The vaccines do work. Now, there was a big report that the VAERS, the Vaccine Adverse Effects Reporting System, had this big spike when the vaccines became available. If you look at any vaccine that's been introduced, has been widely circulated, VAERS reports always spike. When there was the big uh, influenza epidemic back in 2006 um, or 8 or 7 or whatever, 2000s, in the 2000s, uh, the new flu vaccines came out and they were widely distributed. VAERS reports also spiked, just as much as they're spiking now. So people point to the VAERS, oh, look at the big spike in VAERS. What do you do? And plus, anyone can file a VAERS report. In England, they have what's called the yellow card system. You have to be a healthcare professional to do a yellow card report. Here, you can get a hangout and you can do a VAERS report, essentially. So the spike in VAERS reports, and if you look at the VAERS reports, it's, oh, I got a headache. Oh, I had a nose relief. I had a, it's neither here nor there, frankly. Um, so the spike in VAERS reports is really not significant, frankly. Now, with the um, adenovirus-based vaccines, Janssen, you have to give Janssen credit because there was a report about blood clots in young women uh, in the vein of sinuses, which that's a rare place to get blood clots. Um, but it's clear that's rare, and it's also clear that's age stratifying. And Janssen did the right thing. They told the FDA when they saw the reports, it was pulled, further work was done, and it was then released. Um, and then Janssen themselves said, younger women probably shouldn't get this vaccine. They handled that, I thought, really well. So, you know, let's give kudos where kudos should be given. Do they have a financial incentive for the vaccine to be successful? Well, sure they do. Of course they do. But they did the right thing, so well, yeah, let's, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, Tom. I think there's a potential contradiction that I'd just like to hear you ruminate on a little bit. Um, it, it's just something that I struggle with a lot when I'm thinking about these issues. On the one hand, all ideas are on the table. On the other hand, there are certain conspiracy theories that shouldn't be listened to at all. That statement was made. On the surface, that looks like a contradiction. Might you be able to talk a little bit about how you sort of identify highly ridiculous ideas that shouldn't be on the table? Yeah, so in science, we have these things that we call theories. Now, in popular speech, when we say theory, we mean a guess. I have a theory of who killed Kennedy. What you mean is you have a guess. When we use the term theory in science, we mean essentially a hypothesis that has been promoted to theory because of its explanatory power. Essentially, the evidence for this, this, this um, statement, for this explanation, has just piled higher and higher and higher so that the trust in it and its usefulness as a heuristic that means to explain things has just become so powerful that we call it a theory. We depend on it when we go to the bench. Certain conspiracy theories essentially are usually propounded on the basis essentially of some sort of very popular mistrust or something like that. Let's just go back to the Kennedy assassination again. Um, someone I listened to and I really like is Megyn Kelly. Megyn Kelly had, um, the, had the younger Kennedy essentially on her show and he thinks the CIA was involved with the assassination of John F. Kennedy, his assistant uh, uh, cousin. Um, that's a conspiracy theory. Now, does he have a does he have an interest essentially in that? Well, sure, because just some sort of lone gunman, some sort of crazed communist, likely Harvey Oswald, 
that doesn't give JFK's death the meaning that it would have. If, the gov if he, he stood against the swamp, he stood against the government, and he was killed for it. You see the meaning that gives the, the assassination now? So some of these, I think, theories come out of the need to make meaning out of things that are very hard to extract meaning. Others, I think, come from just an inherent distrust of institutions. I think there's a difference between skepticism and mistrust that breeds storytelling. I think we need to rein in our storytelling. And that's, I think, is a difference. Science, I think, when you have theories, a, a theory, I guess, to some extent, is storytelling. But it's constricted storytelling. It's constricted by the data. Conspiracy theories are not constricted. They're, they're, they're essentially driven by the imagination. And they're only constricted by what people will believe, essentially. And that, I think, is one of the borders, one of the things that constrict it. That's, I think, the, the way, essentially, you distinguish between the two. Yeah. Can I suggest another to add on that? Please. Some, some science is replicable. You can do it over and over again. Mm -hmm. Some is not. Like historical science or forensic science, you can't restage a murder, for instance. So you have to have an explanation for that. With abductive reasoning, which means reasoning to the best explanation. Right. Sometimes called retrodictive reasoning. Okay, yeah. yeah. On the other hand, there's there's stuff you can do experiments on. Mm -hmm. So the kind of stuff you can do experiments on, you can have a fairly high level of certainty with that. Because somebody can come along and, and redo the experiment yes. and either confirm or deny it. But so just in the kinds of things that we can know for sure, it's much, there's much more validity in things that a person can trust for herself or himself, because you can do the, redo the experiment. Mm -hmm. And then the things which you can't redo the experiment, you have to have a little bit less certainty about those things. Sure. Would you say that's accurate? Yeah, yeah. I still think that there are reasonable reconstructions of the past, or fanciful reconstructions of the past. Right. And that, again, it's going to cohere essentially with processes that are at work today. Were those processes at work in the past? Do you have reason to suspect they weren't? Do you have reason to suspect they were? And how do we have reason to suspect that they were? So if these processes essentially cohere with things that we know that are going on today, right. when guns go off, bullets go at high velocity, and they penetrate flesh, and they cause people to bleed and get infection and die. That happened in the past, it happens today. When people fall, do they fall forward or backward? Boom. You know, that, these are things I think you can use to reconstruct things. Yes, those reconstructions are conjectures, but again, they're limited by things that are possible in the way things you know, that they, the way things work, essentially. So yeah, so your range of possibilities, I think, is wider. So that means the humility you have to have is deeper. We are out of time. You guys have been great. Thank you. Guys.